Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for the introduction. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just to give you an overview that where do we come from, why we even thought of this, uh, you know, winter school and what, why we thought of this theme and how we are going to think about all these themes that, you know, various interests that you have in accessibility, in education, in gender, how do we think about them in a slightly different way than you have been maybe uh, thinking so far. So. Um, the theme of the winter school is inclusion and technology. These are the two main words that you see there. So wh why we need to th think about inclusion and technology together? Let us start with that. So uh, the first is, I'm guessing everybody know about sustainable development goals, which was developed by UN and the member countries agreed to all these goals. And one of the sustainable uh, development goals is that ICT should be fundamental in the way we think about achieving all these uh, sustainable goals. So access to ICT and how ICT, access to ICT is sort of an underlying factor that would help us achieve many of the sustainable development goals that we have. And there are specific mention about education, the educational goal, goal of women empowerment and gender equality, and also uh, a goal to uh, reach out to uh, children and uh, accessibility issues. These were three main points where ICT was thought to be a fundamental game changer. So that's what is documented through the Sustainable Development Goals uh, document that you uh, may access online. And one of the things that is important here that ICT was considered to be as important as something like physical infrastructures like energy or uh, roads. So as fundamental for development as uh, these, th uh, these things. So uh, if this is the context in which we are looking at ICT towards inclusion and development of a large seg uh, you know, segment of our population, what's, what are we doing about it in India? So just coming home, what we are doing about it. I'm guessing that most of you who are from India also know about the Digital India program. And one of the things that the Digital India program does is looking at, again, digital technologies for transforming, uh, you know, the way we are governed, the way we live our life and many parts of our existence. The next part where I'm going to get at is looking at this whole uh, point of digital divide, I think, which everybody is aware of. And as I started with, uh, I'll talk about sustainable development goals in a bit. And how digital divide sort of is the buzzword to frame all these issues of technology and development. And we are slightly going to take uh, a detour from digital divide. I'm going to be slightly critical of this whole discourse of digital divide and try to show you that how we, what is the problem with this discourse of digital divide and how do we move on to a discourse which is more about digital inclusion and how do we understand inclusion from in the context of digital technologies. And of course, uh, the last part of the presentation is about what's the agenda of the winter school and how do we go about think, thinking about digital inclusion. Uh, feel, feel free to stop me at any time when you have questions. So as I already mentioned, uh, sustainable development goal is something that uh, is, I think now we have about 15 main goals and they are now uh, broken into many sub goals and all these sub goals will have uh, indicators list. So how do you achieve these goals? So because today's theme is also about gender, I'll just give an example in the context of gender equality and uh, sustainable goal. So that's goal number five. And one of the, uh, so, and that says that ICT should, one of the sub goal is to give access to digital technologies as a way of empowering women and uh, also marginal section of women. So women who usually would not have access to uh, digital technologies. And one of the indicators of how do we empower women through digital technologies is that a large number of women have mobile phones or any other digital devices to themselves. Now, if this is the way we are thinking about it here, the issue that they are addressing is access to digital devices or access to digital technologies. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. 
sorry I think this uh, <laughs> how can we move further. Yeah. So, now coming home to uh, India. So, digital India program which is also a follow up of the national e-governance plan which was introduced in 2006. Uh, this was formally introduced in 2015. It also draws on a lot of projects and the project uh, program goals that uh, NEGP or the national e-governance plan had in 2006. And the three pillars that it looks at is digital infrastructure, governance and services and digital empowerment of citizens. So, when we are talking about digital empowerment of citizens, here also they address this whole issue of digital divide, access to digital technologies and how by accessing digital technologies we can feel empowered and also we can do a lot of things in terms of livelihood, in terms of uh, participating in governance, in terms of accessibility and many of these issues that many of you are interested in here. Now, again, this also talks about digital divide in a way. So, both sustainable goal and digital India program, they have this one thing in common that digital technologies are very important for empowerment of uh, marginalized sections, marginalized in different forms and also uh, access to these technologies have the potential to transform their life for better. So, this is what they, this both these policy documents that I am referring to talk about. Now, what is the problem with that? So, uh, digital divide has been as a you know uh, way of thinking about digital in, uh, technologies have been there for a very long time. It was I think 80s and 90s were the heydays of this uh, discourse which has now been uh, critically looked at and evaluated by many ICTD uh, scholars. So, what are the three problems that I am going to talk about? First that when you talk about in, in, uh, in this way about digital technologies and inclusion, first thing that you are looking at only physical access to a particular device. So, your focus is to give access to device and you believe there is a faith in an inherent virtue of uh, that device that will change everybody's life. So, the uh, the device or the technology in itself holds the potential to change your life. So, as soon as you have access to it, so everybody should have access to it and as soon as you have access to it, your life is going to change. That is the first point. And the second point, so this is a first problem. I will explain why it is a problem. The second point that it underplays that once you have access, there are various degrees of access. So, let us say uh, the way many of you access technology, is it the same way that uh, somebody sitting in a rural area in India who has access to mobile phones, like I am talking about the device, will access the uh, mobile phone in the same way? Do you see your usage patterns are similar in terms of time and content? No, right? So, but both of you have access to the technology, to the device. So, it does not capture when you look at digital divide, you basically create a binary of human uh, population and say haves and have nots. So, your focus then completely on you completely invest your energy to bring the have nots onto the haves. What you miss out on this, this degrees of use, how you are able to engage with the technology is not the same in spite of the access. And when you start asking this question that why in spite of having access, the way we engage with the technology is not the same, that is when you slightly move away from this whole haves and have nots kind of a framing of digital technologies. The third problem with that, it sort of try to see dig this digital divide debate, it is try to capture a very causal relationship between technology and our lives. So, Technology becomes a cause and if I have that technology with me, it will have a certain impact or an effect. And everything else that will help me to have that effect is sort of ignored. So, you, you all understand what I mean by a causal relationship? If anybody does not understand, please uh, you know you can interrupt me. Sorry? 
Yeah, so you are trying to map a causal relationship between digital technologies or any technology for that matter and our lives. Because if I am saying that digital technologies will empower me, so I am saying empowerment is the effect and digital technologies are the reason for that effect. So when you map such a causal relationship between technology and any kind of impact, it can be bad or, you know, and I'm sure you heard very negative statement about technologies also in a similar fashion that, you know, Facebook leads to, I don't know, addiction uh, among youth. As if that Facebook is the only problem that if that was, if you take it out, if you think of it this way, so basically if you take Facebook out, that addiction will, with the internet will go away, right? So there is a very straightforward, simplified causal relationship that is being established, which is a problem. And why it is a problem is when you start thinking about what does it mean by, what do we mean by social inclusion? That's the question that we need to ask before even thinking about what leads to social inclusion. So if, even if we say that technology leads to social inclusion, we first need to understand what do we mean by social inclusion and what role then can access to technology play in bringing about that social inclusion. So most of the time when we think about uh, inclusion or uh, improvement in our life or development, we only think about economic resources, that how we can improve our life in terms of some material needs that we have. But, and so if you have money, then you can do a lot of things. In development economics from 1980s, many of you who actually, some of you actually study economics here, um, Amartya Sen's concept of capability framework that just because you have access to economic resources does not mean that you have a better life. You might have a lot of money in a village, but if there is no hospital, there is no way you can have a better life, right? So, this, the, I'm just telling you in a very, uh, you know, catchy way what it means, but it's a much more deep and philosophical theory, uh, which I don't have the time to get into. But the point here, drawing on those kind of literature, what social inclusion is basically saying that the extent that individual families and communities are able to fully participate in society and control their own lives, taking into account a variety of factors, which are economic resources, it could be employment, health, education, housing, culture, recreation, like a whole host, uh, host of things. So it, it is, it overlaps with this whole concept of social and economic resources that we most of the time think about when we think about in, uh, you know, empowerment, but it's not the same. One of the key words here is not just having access, is having a meaningful way of engaging with things that you want to engage with. So, even if you have access to a phone, can you use it in the way that you want to use? So there is a question of agency that, or the, you know, in, in simple words, it would be the question of choice. What choice I have and what other resources I need to make use of the device that I have in my hand. And that's what we mean by digital inclusion, that not just access, but do we have a choice in the way I access these technologies? Or do I have a choice to use these technologies with the range of possibilities that it, they come with to do what I want to do? This is the key question that we want to sort of focus on during these three days. And there have been a literature of digital inclusion which looked at what other resources you need in order to engage with digital technologies. And some of them are, for example, physical, compute, uh, physical infrastructures, uh, digital resources that you might have an access to your, mo uh, you know, mobile phones are very cheap, feature phones are very cheap, now you can buy one. But can you also buy data? Can you have a continuous access to internet the way many of us do? And it's not just a question of whether you can afford it or not. It's a question of, do you get data in a seamless manner in all parts of our country? You might not. Do we have telecommunication infrastructure which reaches out to even the remote, remotest corner of our country? And what is the quality of those telecommunication infrastructure that we are talking about? 
digital uh, content, one of the examples could be, uh, which I think many of the uh, big tech companies are working now, to make available content in regional languages or human vernacular languages. That even if I have the phone, even if I have physical infrastructure, to what extent I can understand what's going on if it's not, or the content not just in terms of language, but whatever is available on that platform, how much it is relevant for me and my life. That is something that we're talking about in terms of digital resources. Then, of course, human resources in terms of literacy, your education level, and I'm talking about digital literacy as well. Some of the times when we use, when we, uh, the technology, digital technologies also, if you look at in last 10 years, it has transformed like really fast. But the way many of us have sort of coped with it seemed like very seamless. But for many people, it might not. It might be very difficult for them to keep just at pace with the changes that are taking place. And that's where the human resources come in handy. And of course, the social resources, which is community and institutional support. So for example, when we are talking about uh, gender, when we are talking about accessibility, when we are talking about low-income groups, this is also a very key factor in the way they are able to engage with this technology. So it's not just important to have access or be able to afford it, but how much support that we have, like Professor Sadagopan was talking about having a beautiful building, but you just cannot access it because of certain conditions that you have. So what's the point of having a beautiful building and you have full access, technically you can you know, roam around, but does the you know, community support you to access that building? to roam around in the building as much it supports other people. So this is what we sort of want to address going forward. And the structure of the winter school is basically <coughs> looking at digital technologies across three, these three groups. Not to say that these are the only three groups that you can think of when you think of digital inclusion, but these points that I raised, these you know, four resources that I'm talking about, the physical, the digital, the human, and the social resources, how these resources become critical for these three groups of the population, for them to actually get included in the digital society that we are all dreaming of. So I'll just end here. If you have any question, uh, you can uh, feel free to ask. So just the agenda of the you know, three days. So first day, we are going to talk about the gender vertical. Second day, we are going to talk about the accessibility vertical. And the third day, we are going to talk about uh, the class or the you know, economic class uh, vertical and see how we can sort of bring in digital technologies into each of these categories. At the end of the day, every day, there will be a design jam session. So basically, you will hear a lot of critical uh, issues across throughout the day. So at the end of the day, what we have is to handhold you and to think about how do we map this onto when we think about designing a technology. So I talked a lot about digital inclusion, but when you're designing for a particular group of people, what does it actually mean in concrete terms? How do you map all these understanding into thinking about technology design? So every day we'll have, uh, first two days we'll have those design, design jam sessions. Last day, we expect we'll uh, divide you into groups uh, that you can start working with uh, from today onwards. And the last day, we expect you to come up with your ideas. So we'll discuss that more in details at the end of the day.